Now to introduce our next speaker, it is my pleasure to introduce Thomas McNerney of Sound Biologics. He's their principal scientist. He has multiple decades of experience developing manufacturing processes for clinical scale and research with experience at Sigma Aldrich, Genentech, Immunex, Amgen, and currently Sound Biologics. He has been involved in all phases of clinical and commercial process from harvest to formulated drug substance and marketing. Today, he will be sharing with us impact of viscosity on the manufacturability of paired monoclonal antibodies. And without further ado, it is my pleasure to turn it over to Thomas McNerney to share his presentation. Thank you very much, Grace, and thank you, Rio Sense, for inviting me to this presentation. Uh, show, okay. We can see your screen. It's just on the GoToWebinar panel. Is this it? Can you see? Just want to open up your presentation. Can you see the presentation now? Right now, we're seeing your web browser. Oh. Oh, I see that. Now we can see your presentation. Oh, interesting. Okay. Okay. So uh, today I'm going to talk about manufacturability of, of paired an monoclonal antibodies and the impact of uh, viscosity has uh, in terms of the manufacturability. Now, um, what for sound biologics here is um, for about six and a half years, we never had a sign in front of the door except for that little paper copy in the window. It's probably becoming a historical uh, marker for uh, on the site. And it was about six months ago, uh, there's been a complete redevelopment of the site. And we finally got a sign that says where we're at. It was always interesting because when we had uh, visitors come by, they were always driving around in the parking lot trying to figure out where Sound Biologics was. But now with the new sign, instead of this little uh, piece of paper in the uh, window here saying Sound Biologics, they can find this pretty easily. We used to have to come out and stand and, and uh, flag them down. Uh, page down, okay. Oops, I see how this is going to work. Uh, so for a little bit of introduction, Sound Biologics, you know, we are located in Bothell, Washington. We're just north of Seattle. So it gives you a, a good idea. We, you know, we're just a startup firm. Right now, we're about 25 people, maybe a little bit more. Uh, there's been a growth in, uh, in the company. Um, on this, uh, I guess the wonderful thing that I find about a startup firm, I get to wear multiple hats, you know, whereas I, uh, my experience at Genentech and Immunex and, or, or, and Amgen, usually you get pigeonholed into uh, uh, a particular discipline. With a small company, I get, get to do a lot, and then, which is really fun. Now, what we do, well, our, our specialty is, is we make two antibodies in one cell. And, and the focus so far has been on IgG types, types of antibodies. And the other thing that we do is uh, we engineer these things to take away uh, certain attributes like cytotoxicity or you know high molecular weight. And you know, basically we make them bio better um, on that. Right now, we have two antibodies in, in early stage clinical trials. The first one furthest along is an anti-PD-1 and, and anti-CTL-4, which is basically our proof of concept. Uh, this molecule is already, uh, each of these molecules are produced separately and are, are commercially available. And there's a lot of clinical data about pairing these antibodies um, in the clinic in terms of um, um, fighting uh, cancer. I forget which of the indications. Our second one that just got approved uh, like about six months ago is an anti-CD20 and anti-CD37. Uh, and that right now 
is in the early stages of phase one. Uh, currently, you know, uh, there has been a couple of programs, uh, monoclonal uh, or antibody pairs that we need to uh, dose at very high concentrations of about 150 mg plus uh, on that. You know, for 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 drug delivery is the expected. Although we'll have to wait and see uh, what the clinical trials kind of tell us. But the expectation right now, from all the modeling uh, that the biology group has done, and is suggesting around 150 with a certain ratio uh, of antibodies with this uh, with this indication. The other one that's kind of coming down is uh, is a novel. Um, antibody fusion structure um, on this. And so that's gonna be a challenge at this. Right now, the plan is to make it as a single antibody and then we're gonna kind of pair it um, with other antibodies later on. So I'm gonna talk about the impact of viscosity on the downstream process. Um, and this applies to any, you know, uh, antibody uh, on in the in the, um, you know whether it's paired or unpaired you know the principles are the same the the thing I'm trying to get across here is the downstream process that we do at Sim Biologics and this is very important because uh, uh, the data I'm going to kind of show you is um, the impact of uh, the pairing of antibodies and also the uh, uh, buffer components and pH it has on in terms of the viscosity. So for all of the molecules that we're going to show here, they have either gone through uh, a process, you know, protein A followed by AEX or, you know, or the full uh, type of CGMP antibody uh, purification. So we have done uh, both ways. The important thing here is uh, the uh, purity levels after the AX has always been consistent. The host cell proteins, you know, jet are less than 10 parts per million. Host DNA, we don't even detect it. And um, the endotoxin, um, you know, is e extremely low. Now, for a GM, uh, a GMP process is we, we need to incorporate two uh, viral clearance steps in here. Um, the first one is the low pH and activation uh, right after the protein A. And then uh, we do the uh, uh, a viral removal, which is the 20 nanometer filtration. Now, for the data that I'm going to show here is we've done it both ways with and without the viral inactivation but typically we don't do a 20 nanometer uh, filtration because of the expense of this filter. And two, the other problem is, is because we're a small research uh, uh, facility, um, getting these filters in, we're on the low priority from the manufacturers um, uh, in terms of uh, getting these filters. Um, the priority because of the COVID-19 uh, issues has always been commercial um, and and generally the larger companies will get priority of these filters. Now, sprinkle in in all of these steps is we do a bio burn filtration after each uh, most of the steps and then those steps will include after the harvest, after the uh, low pH and activation, the AEX, uh, the uh, the viral filter, and then obviously the formulation. So as you can imagine here is if we're having impact in terms of um, viscosity on some of these process steps, going through a 0.2 micron filter, you can also run into that. And I'll show you that in, in a couple of slides. The other thing I kind of want to mention is you got to consider the GMP facility that we're going into. And right now we are partnering with a company in China to do our GMP manufacturing. And one of the things we have to consider, and I'll get into this a little bit later, 
is the operating temperature of the facility. And in our case, it's 18 to 26 degrees. The other thing that we got to consider is, is how long does the unit operation take to complete before we have to move um, to get it done before the next harvest comes down um, and, and, and needs that step um, to do the processing. And typically for us right now, uh, in some companies, we, we've always had 24 hours. Sometimes it's a little bit less. Uh, for us right now, it's roughly about 24 to 48 hours uh, between unit operations. So things are help can be held around for that long. The other thing you got to consider is manufacturing folks need to produce a certain amount of mass and they love reproducible robust processes. If all of a sudden, like uh, if you had a viscosity issue where it shuts down a process and, you, and you, you'll tell from the uh, high pressure, you know, that is time and money for these folks and also you run into a problem is you have to do an investigation and try to figure out why it happened and, and what things you're going to consider so for me for developing a process we're looking at developing a robust and reproducible process so the manufacturing folks don't have any issues so these are some of the things that go into developing a process so on this, this was a single antibody um, here, and uh, we um, had some several issues in terms of uh, on the manufacturing process. And uh, measuring the viscosity, what we can see here is uh, at low pH, at pH 5, in, in this case, it was formulated in uh, an acetate pH 5 sucrose uh, buffer. You know, the viscosity uh, increases very rapidly at very low concentrations of proteins. Whereas if we change the formulation buffer to a histidine uh, phosphate at 6.8 with a little bit of salt and, suc and sucrose in there, we, we change this. So this is not unexpected. This is something that, you know, if you go through uh, the papers and, uh, you know, that's in the literature, it, it's known that, you know, you can uh, change the viscosity with formulation. Now, what's going on here with this molecule and why is the viscosity is, is if you take a look at self-interact and chromatography, and then the, the molecule PSB113 was immobilized to the column. The egg column was uh, a column that was immobilized with TRIS, um, so it doesn't have any protein. And what you can see here is when we're up around pretty close to neutral pH, the blue, which is the uh, 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 113 immobilized column versus the uh, dead column, we can see they have the same migration. But as soon as we drop the pH down, and in this case, we did it with A5SU, but we've done it with at pH 5 and just acetate, uh, what we can see here is we see uh, a significant retention of the antibody uh, with itself uh, on, on the column compared to the, uh, the dead column. So what we're seeing here is this viscosity increase is due to self-interaction. This is not surprising. It's been reported in the literature. Whoops. Okay. So the first problem step that we say, and I'm going to have to walk you through this because it's a pretty complicated slide, is, is the binding in a loop column. And in this case, it was the protein A. What we can see here, um, uh, laser. What we can see here is the purple line has to do, uh, deal with uh, the on the chromatograms. It has to do with the column pressure drop across the column. So we measure the pressure at the top of the column and at the bottom of the column, and, and this is the differential. The blue here is the uh, trace at uh, 280 nanometers of the column. And what we can see here is on the equivalent load, as we start loading the column, 
the pressure increases uh, pretty rapidly. And uh, for these columns, you got to remember is uh, the, we have pressure limits on the columns before they either shatter or they leak. So uh, a lot of times um, columns are rated to about 45 PSI. And so we set limits of just below that so we don't run into any issues um, on that. So what we did here is we saw the pressure increase. We reduced the flow rate. Uh, and what we see is we see a steady state in terms of the pressure going across the column. Then when we hit the wash and elution step, what what we see is that you know the pressure in drops, you know, after the load for the for the first wash. Uh, we have a wash two here that removes impurities and the viscosity or the pressure increases because of, of the buffers. But what was interesting here is uh, when we did the elution, uh, which is in this area here, is we see a sudden increase in terms of the uh, pressure drop across the column. And, um, and in this case, uh, what we did was slow the flow rate down to, to relieve that pressure. Now this was a very indication, good indication at the time that we had a viscosity problem at the time. Uh, we didn't have uh, the MV rock in, so you know we assumed that there was a viscosity problem. Now, what's going on here? Now, on these columns here, what you do is you load from top. In this case, we were loading from top to bottom, and what happens here is the protein concentration um, gets near sat is uh, at the is saturated or near the saturated at the top of the column and the protein concentration is um, not saturated um, at the bottom of the column. So you see these gradients going across. And so when you do the elution here, what happens is, is the stuff that's at the high near the saturation. And then in this case, this is protein A and the saturation is right around 60 to 80 grams per liter of resin. That protein concentration coming off the column is pretty high. So you're right around 60, 80 um, uh, grams per liter, somewhere in that neighborhood. And if you remember, I'm gonna back up here. Can I back up? There we go. At about 60 to 80, um, um, uh, grams per liter, or in this case, it's mg per mil, is we're seeing a viscosity between about 10 and 15 CPs uh, coming off that column. That was enough to cause this pressure to, to uh, increase very, very rapidly. And so the mitigation here was to slow down the flow rate. Now for protein A, you know, uh, the data that I showed you is that uh, Acidic pHs, we see an increase in terms of the protein interacting with itself, causing an increase in terms of viscosity. You know, protein A needs low pH in terms of doing the elution off the column is typically the way it is. So our mitigation strategy is when we start the elution is to slow the flow rate down uh, so we don't see this rapid pressure increase uh, as we do the elution. So the next area was during the formulation of this antibody. And on the uh, graph on the right or uh, uh, is a typically a TFF system. I mean, there's lots of tanks and feeds, but the important thing I wanna get at, uh, the mention here is we measure the pressure before we enter the filter, after we enter the filter and we measure the uh, pressure um, coming off uh, of the filter of the filtering. So we measure all all of these pressures uh, type of thing and then we, we kind of do a plot. We also measure the filtering rate, the flow coming out. And the graph on the bottom kind of gives you an idea is you know you have a channel and we feed it in at a constant flow rate. you know uh, we put some pressure, so we can drive the fluid across the 
uh, membrane called the filtrate. Uh, these membranes are designed to retain antibodies and so it comes off. And so what you're seeing here is we see a pressure gradient going across this filter and we see an antibody concentration going across this filter. So the pressure drops and then the antibody co concentration um, increases. Now we try to control this, but what we're trying to prevent is on the graph on the extreme right is showing you a dead end filtration where what we get is a protein gel layer across this membrane. Now, all proteins create this on uh, TFF type of membranes, and what we try to do is control this. Now, it's really hard to measure this concentration. You can't even pipette it in some cases, but this was a great, great picture or is a great picture of showing you the differentiation. So this brown color here is becoming a gel uh, versus um, less protein concentration up here. So we see this all the time. Now, the way we can tell that we have a, a, a problem is by the pressure. And so on this one for the blue line here is when we did the formulation at pH five, we see an increase in terms of the pressure as we um, dye filtered the protein um, into the uh, A5SU buffer or the acetate at pH five with sucrose buffer. Whereas, and that was a real, that was really unusual because we typically see what is the red line here where the pressure we can kind of, it remains constant. And then what we can do is dial in the uh, maximum filtrate rate that we can without fouling the membrane by uh, turning this retentate valve and putting some back pressure, which is indicated here where we increase the uh, viscosity. And what we can kind of see on the graph below the filtrate rate, we see a slight increase in terms of the filtrate rate by increasing this pressure. Now the blue here, uh, for the A5 issue, uh, even though we maxed out in terms of the pressure going across that filter, as we can measure it because of the limit of the pressure gauge, which is limited to about 30 PSI, what we see is the filtrate rate increasing as uh, we go along, uh, as we um, exchange more of the buffer uh, with the protein. And this is telling me here is the pressure is actually increasing over over this uh, filter uh, because of the increase, because the filtrate rate is pressure driven type of thing. So the issue becomes is, is with, at, in the formulating in A5SU with this viscosity, we don't have any control of the, of the process in terms of preventing uh, the gel-like formation from occurring on the membrane and, and fouling the membrane and, and causing actually, you know, getting this gel-like pro, um, protein uh, membrane built up on the membrane will also uh, affect recovery of the protein. So we didn't have much control. Now, in both of these examples, the protein A column and, uh, and on the TFF, it's very much, we're measuring the pressure going in, we're measuring the pressure going out. It's very much uh, similar to how the uh, MV rock operates. Uh, even though we only got two pressure gauges on the MV rock, it has four. It's measuring that pressure differential going across there and converting it into uh, viscosity uh, um, units. And so we're seeing the same thing here. So these two things before we got the MV, MV rock was an indication that we were having a viscosity problem. Uh, with this molecule across the process, process operations. The other problem too is I don't have, I'm not showing the data here, is this pressure, uh, this viscosity increase requires more force in order to push it through a membrane. And so we also had the same issues with a, a 0.2 micron filters. Now the 113 was unique is because we're seeing this viscosity at very low protein concentrations. Um, at the time, uh, the target for the formulation was 25 MIGs, and yet we were seeing a viscosity problem. So there was, 
there was issues uh, with this molecule with this molecule. So now I'm going to talk about uh, the pairing of the antibodies um, and looking at viscosity and the interactions at um, high concentrations, uh, high uh, formulation concentrations. So on this particular project, uh, we started out with uh, the single antibodies and we had um, two antibodies that were targeting the same uh, antibody T, but they had different amino acid sequences. And then we were pairing it with uh, antibody I, uh, um, with this. The other thing I wanted to point out here is we kind of here, we kind of set a target of uh, formula uh, of 20 uh, CPs or milli pascals a second uh, that we did not want to go above. Now, I, I know this was a guideline uh, uh, from the the main uh, from the people that uh, 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 that wrote the paper, and there was a lot of things that go into consideration. But what we can see here is is when we look at the single antibody um, viscosity versus its, its concentration, is, is we can kind of see that antibody I um, is uh, having a faster rate of uh, viscosity versus concentration versus antibodies T and I. What was interesting here is since we were pairing is on the graph on the uh, right is is when we paired these antibodies uh, at a 50-50 uh, ratios. And what you can see here, and I have to move this. Yep, there we go. Uh, is, is when we pair these antibodies, Antibody T11718 with you know antibody I is we see a viscosity that's kind of a slight increase over what we see uh, with the just a single antibody uh, T by itself. But we see a increase in terms of the viscosity more than what we see when we combine if we had the antibodies at 150 MIGs per mil each and you add both of these up, we see the viscosity increase um, more than what was expected. Now, come on. All right, there we go. Okay, um, sorry, it's taken a while for the screen to, um, uh, change. So, taking a look at the individual, another way of looking at it is taking a look at the individual antibodies. So, when we pair E11718 with antibody I, what we see is the uh, paired antibodies, the viscosity actually kind of goes down or is about equivalent to uh, the single antibody by itself versus. The uh, other antibody, the T11764 with antibody I, when we combine them, we see the viscosity go up. So this is telling me that we're seeing interactions going on between uh, the two antibodies uh, with antibody T uh, with the different amino acid sequences having the same effect. Now this has been observed by uh, recently, um, by Tyl Genuova, I believe I pronounced that correctly, uh, uh -huh. where they were pairing uh, different antibody fragments and whole antibodies and, and they were seeing viscosity. So what we can see here is um, the interactions of the antibodies, depending on the amino acid sequence, can either increase or uh, cause a slight, uh, slight decrease in terms of the uh, viscosity. Now, looking at the uh, interaction chromatography, and in this case, what we did was we immobilized antibody I to the column and then 
D uh, or the dead column is being the column that was immobilized only with TRIS and no antibody. What we can see here is at pH five, antibody T11718 is repulsed uh, from um, antibody I while um, antibody T11764 is attracted. And so you're seeing this difference in terms of the uh, retention time relative to the uh, non-immobilized column. Now, as we go up in terms of the pH, what we can see is as the pH changes, um, in this case, uh, antibody E11718, uh, you know, starts the migration starts shifting so it's starting to interact a little bit more with the uh, uh, antibody I, whereas uh, antibody T11764, the uh, interaction decreases as we go up in pH. Unfortunately for this one, this one kind of killed, uh, uh, on this program, antibody T11764 uh, paired with antibody I, this kind of killed it at this point in time. Um, there was some other data from the biology group where they favored the 11718, uh, but for this particular one, th this was the one that kind of told us that uh, whichever way we went, we were going to have uh, issues with formulation. And the feeling was is if we stayed with the acidic formulations, that we would be uh, have better uh, uh, success. Uh, for formulated product in, in, uh, in the clinic, and also for formulation for stability, for long-term stability. So um, when this was presented, uh, one of the questions that came from our uh, uh, partners in, in China was uh, what, you know, what was the temperature? And, we were doing everything at about room temperature. And in our case, it was about 21 to 22 degrees. And uh, management was very gracious and sort of saying, well, we were, you know, 20 degrees plus or minus five uh, type of thing. At that point in time, we ran out and bought the, uh, 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 the water bath from um, Rio Sense. And, uh, uh, to start look, taking a look at temperature on these uh, antibodies. And we took a look at the individual antibodies. And what you can see here is antibody I versus antibody uh, T uh, is as the antibody concentration goes up, uh, the temperature has a great impact for antibody I versus T in terms of uh, increasing or or decrease in the viscosity in terms of which way you, as you, well, in this case, it'll be increasing the viscosity as you lower the temperature from 26 to 18. And as you remember here is for the facility, our operating range is between 18 and 26 degrees. So that's where those numbers came from in terms of uh, designating, uh, uh, determining which temperature ranges to use. Now, when we started pairing these antibodies, instead of showing you a whole bunch of graphs, what I did here was I looked at relative viscosity versus uh, how much the relative viscosity increases as you lower the temperature from 26 to 18 degrees. And uh, we looked at, in this case, the uh, pink or the uh, being the antibody I, uh, versus the green, which is antibody T. E. Um, you can see a big difference as you change uh, the temperature from um, uh, 26 to 18 degrees. But what, what you can see here is as, as these ratios is we're seeing a decrease. And we looked at uh, the target for the clinic was a ratio of antibody T to antibody I of 60-40, but the specification was, uh, you know, 50-50 to 70-30. So we looked at all of these ranges uh, to bracket this. 
And what you're kind of seeing here as we increase the amount of antibody I versus antibody T. So as antibody I goes up and T goes down in terms of the ratio, what we're seeing here is an increase in terms of viscosity. Now, all of this was done in uh, A5SU at, at the time. So taking a look at the individual antibodies, um, again here on the, on the left, and what we've done here is we changed the formulation buffer to a histidine acetate at various pHs. It was right now our kind of our lead candidate uh, in terms of going to the clinic. And what you can see here is with antibody I, as you uh, look at decrease in the PA, uh, the temperature from 18 to 30, what we can see here is it's greatly affected by the pH of the solution. So as the more acidic we get, the lower that um, viscosity comes and, and the curve becomes a little bit more shallow. Now, for antibody T, it didn't make much difference at all. Now, there is a subtle difference if you really blow it, in, blow it up, which we can kind of see here from the uh, paired viscosities at 4.9. What is interesting here is with antibody I, what we're seeing is the de decrease in viscosity as the temperature increase is exponential uh, versus all the other antibodies, you know, the uh, antibody T and then the paired ones, it's all linear. And what we're seeing here on the paired antibodies is that the buffer is making, uh, the pairs is changing that um, uh, viscosity change versus temperature is, is, is changing. It's all, it's, um, for the pH 49, what we're seeing is it all seems to come to a point at 30 degrees, whereas it differentiates at, at, um, at 18. And then, what I'm not showing here, here is uh, the different pHs. And what we see here is uh, obviously antibody I, the, vi the viscosity increases as you go up in pH. But what we're seeing here is uh, with the paired antibodies, this, uh, these curves kind of shift a little bit upwards as we increase in terms of the pH. So the pairing of the antibodies is having an effect in terms of the viscosity on that. And then with the, the other thing uh, is the, um, we're seeing that the type of, or the formulation buffers like the histidine acetate versus the uh, sodium uh, acetate at pH five versus four nine, uh, we do see an effect in terms of the histidine have an effect on the paired antibody viscosity and, uh, on that. So, and it also has an effect for the single antibodies in terms of the, uh, it's, it's viscosity, more so with antibody I than with antibody T. And all of these done were done at 150 mix, so a single concentration. So in summary, the work that we've seen here is consistent with the published literature. So that, that is a good thing for me because it gives me a foundation uh, for future work that we're seeing things that have been already been reported. We know, you know, the amino acid sequence, the buffer composition, the pH, uh, the protein interactions with itself, or in this case with the pairs, it's gonna be cross, you know, and temperature all have an influence. Now, what's important here is um, that pH, the buffer composition, and the temperature all have an effect. You know, uh, they're all interactive. So if you change one, they're going to affect the other. And then the the other thing you got to bring into is the the ratio of the uh, two antibodies or the protein protein interactions going on um, with this also has an influence in terms of the viscosity. Now, what we've seen here is uh, with temperature, even though it's a very narrow range of 18 to 
30 degrees, we're seeing a, a linear decrease in terms of as we go up in temperature uh, with paired antibodies. And, and in, in this case, it was antibody T11718 um, on that. But we also see an exponential uh, with antibody I, you know, on that one. The earlier uh, time point uh, or earlier thoughts on this one was the protein gel formation. We see a different gelling prop R characteristics with protein I versus protein T. Um, and we can tell this uh, from the dead infiltrations that uh, if you remember on the picture on, you know, earlier in this presentation, where I was showing you the did end is the gel formation. We do see a difference there. And the other thing that we do see is when we um, go to resolubilize that gel, there's very different properties between I and T. It's kind of very hard to quantitate, but from the visual observations, we are seeing this, um, uh, this effect. How much does this protein gel uh, solubility have an effect, um, it, you know, remains to be determined uh, on this, but it, it's essentially, it, it's somewhat akin to some properties of like uh, solubility of amino acids, where they're not very soluble, but if they're in the salt form, they, the solubility will change. So I think that there's some, some of that going on um, uh, with these proteins is the salt form of the, uh, is affecting the solubility once these gels are formed. And it, it does have, these gel formations, temperature does have a, have a role in this has been, has been reported in the literature. Now, the one good thing here is from the, the temperature profiles here, from a manufacturability is if we're seeing a high, viscous solutions, we might be able to elevate the temperature instead of operating at, say, you know, 20 degrees or something. If we elevate it to like 25 degrees, we might be able to reduce that viscosity and allow for uh, processing uh, of the antibody to achieve uh, uh, the final uh, drug product uh, type of thing. Now, as I mentioned before, there's a lot of interdependent interactions between buffer composition, you know, uh, uh, you know, pH, protein, protein interactions, you know, and temperature and amino acid sequence. So one of the challenges that we kind of face and, and a lot of other people are facing is how do we uh, screen for the early stage molecules and the high concentrations? And this is much more important for us uh, because um, making a, a couple of grams of material is, is a big do around here. Uh, we just don't have uh, uh, the bioreactors, especially in the early stages. And so we're material limited uh, uh, in, in that respect. So we're trying to do everything with, you know, uh, uh, mix of material is would, what would be nice. And then for the early stage processes, the screen problematic molecules, uh, and there's a number of papers out on this, um, various techniques, you know, from multiple companies and, and, and from academia um, on that, you know, is, you know, that are all insisting that, look, if you do mine, you can do it in the micrograms, uh, type of thing, it's rapid, it's high throughput and stuff. Uh, some of these techniques in our hands, um, you know, might work for us. Others that we've tried, uh, you know, we couldn't we couldn't replicate um, what they've done. So it's 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 going to be a challenge, especially with the upcoming molecules. Um, is how do we um, do these screening? Uh, um, techniques to try to identify problem childs very early on before we get into um, into the uh, process development uh, type of area, or uh, to alert upper management that you know, look, we're going, you know, this is going to be a challenge, 
and we need to be able to, you know, have material and time to screen an acceptable formulation. Um, the big question that comes is, I mean, viscosity, you know, is one aspect uh, of the question. And the real, the real question is, is this going to be uh, product stability and then also uh, basic, ultimately the, the, the clinic. So these are all questions that, um, you know, that need to be answered, but the viscosity and, and the manufacturability only plays one small part. So, and that's all that I have. And so if there's any questions, I'll be glad to take them. Thank you so much, Tom. So we do have some questions coming in. Um, and the first question is, what shear rates did you apply to measure viscosity of the MAB solutions? Okay, for the um, concentration versus um, viscosity curves, what we did was we did a, a shear sweep. And um, I'd have to go back and take a look at the data, but we did. I did a four-point uh, shear sweep from high to low, and that was whatever the software. I I went with the software recommendation. I do, we were working with roughly about a hundred microliters of protein, so that was the shear rate. So we looked at shear rate because we were look trying to look at. Uh, shear thinning or shear thickening. And I will say this at this point in time is for most of the antibodies we looked at, uh, the the impact of uh, the shear rate didn't have, uh, change the viscosity. There was only one molecule that we've looked at where changing the shear rate as we went up decreased viscosity. Hopefully that answered the question. I think that was a perfect answer and we'll wait for a few minutes to see what other questions come in. So if anyone does have questions, go ahead and drop them in the chat now. Oh, and then the other um, on the viscosity thing is for the temperature differentiation, we kept it at one shear rate and uh, I'm trying to rem remember off the top, but basically we did it with 100 microliters and in an, it was 10 times greater than the minimum uh, acceptable shear rate that the uh, MV Rock program recommended is where, where uh, we did those, uh, the temperature uh, versus viscosity at one protein concentration. And someone else has asked, do MADs typically show viscosity spikes with increasing concentration? For us, at this point in time, we haven't seen it. All of ours increase exponentially. Uh, as you go up in protein concentration. So we haven't seen a spike. Now it will plateau out at the gel point, the gelling point. Thank you. And do you reuse the samples when performing repeat measurements at different shear rates? Uh, no, it goes into the big pot with everything else. <laughs> and is there any concern of permanently damaging the sample from the sharing process? Yes, that is a concern, um, especially from the manufacturing side of things, because it's known that uh, shear will induce uh, high molecular weight formation. So we know that from pumps. Uh, if you spin them too fast and you're recirculating, um, you can generate high molecular weight from the increase in terms of the shear. Uh, and some and some proteins are actually shear sensitive, so you have to be careful, especially on TFFs or microfiltration. Uh, 
on that. And so it's that that it's it's somewhat dependent on the uh, molecule that you're studying. That would have to be experimentally uh, determined. Did that answer the question? Yes. And uh, we have another. For screening, what concentration do you typically work with? Well, that depends on what the clinical indications are going to be. Um, for the first couple of molecules that we did, we were going into an IV bag. So that was around 25 to 30. Recently, and especially on this last project, where they wanted to do an uh, uh, to deliver it by injection, uh, they were looking at going as high as they could in terms of the antibody concentration. Uh, that's where uh, we started looking at uh, the viscosity curves versus protein concentrations to determine what would be an acceptable uh, concentration uh, for uh, viscosity uh, in terms of the injection. And then um, because we didn't know what the delivery system was going to be, um, you know, from an injection where it's going to be an auto injector or, or a regular syringe, uh, that's the reason we kind of set a target of about 20 CPs. So I, I know it's kind of a vague question, but there's um, there's a lot of things that go into this consideration. But for us on, on the data I presented, we were kind of looking at 150, but we also from a manufacturability, um, from a TFF, we would need to go higher in that concentration in order to re get uh, recovery off a of TFF membrane. So we would have to, I mean, we did 150, but we should be looking at about 170 or 175 and then diluting back out. But we were kind of at the 150 was, was the thinking that we would go into the uh, phase one trial with from an injection. So that's where that consideration came from. Wonderful. And I will give it just one more minute in case anyone else has any questions they want to squeak in before we end this presentation. Wonderful, Well, there are no more questions. I wanna thank you so much, Tom, for your wonderful presentation. This was really, really excellent data and such great insight. And thank you again for your time and for speaking with us today. Uh, you're welcome.